Do you like 3D animation? Do you want to be able to make animated movies, product visualization, or just make goofy memes for fake internet points online? Cool, because in this video, I'm going to show you how to make all of that. What's up, animator Sharpie, and today I want to teach you about 3D animation. All of it. By the end of this video, you'll be a freaking master in 3D animation. You'll be able to make anything you want. You'll have it all in this tiny pinky finger. Now, I'm known to be a Minimator channel, but I'm slowly moving on to bigger software. I've made my first ever CGI short film that features a robot driving around the city where I live in. And during the production, I started thinking, 3D animation is really hard. You've got all these stages you gotta go through, like modeling, UV unwrapping, rigging, and all these concepts can really get overwhelming if you're just starting to look into it. And that's why I made this video, so I can guide you and make the process more welcoming and less threatening. I'll be your animation guru. Uh, sorry, Andrew. But before I begin, I want to say that if you want to support me with what I do, I do have a Patreon account. It's down below in the description. I think the lowest tier is about three bucks a month, which is not much. But you do get some pretty nice perks, such as early access, one-on-one -on -one time, as well as actual projects that I use in my actual project. <laughs> think about it. Link in the description. Cool. Everybody on board? All right, let's begin. Also, let's tone it down a bit. This is an educational video. In this video, I want to guide you through the key steps of making a 3D animation. First of all, we'll cover the basic theory of 3D animation. I know it's boring, but it's stuff you need to know if you want to understand the steps that follow. Then we'll look at modeling your creations, UV unwrapping, texturing, rigging, animation, lighting. We'll touch a little bit of the simulation side because it's fun as hell. And finally, rendering your work. I'll be using Blender in this video, but be aware that what I'm telling you here is not software specific. You can follow these steps in any other 3D animation software, I'll just be using Blender. So let's begin. Starting off from the basics. In 3D animation, we know vertices, edges, and faces. You need a minimum of two vertices to create an edge, and a minimum of three to create a face. Faces connect together into meshes that can be animated. They can be deformed, which is how rigs work, we'll get to that later. And they can be assigned materials and shaders, which interact with lights, and can be rendered into a series of images, which can be played as a video file. A lot to take in. There's also a virtual camera with the same settings as real cameras, such as depth of field, field of view, radial distortion, and so on. The animation is rendered from the camera's perspective and is a huge mathematical equation of graphs, values, and blending operations. It takes light values from the light sources and bounces them around your meshes, taking into account the materials you've used and outputs different color values onto your fake camera sensor, which then bakes it onto an image or a video, depending on your output settings. This is generally how it all works. A rough understanding. Now let's move on to the actual fun stuff. First of all, you need an actual model that will be shown in the animation. That includes characters, random props, walls and furniture, and even landscapes. Pretty much anything physical that will be visible to the camera. There are two types of modeling, polygon-based and NURBS. Polygons are what I described in the theory part of the video, and they consist of vertices, edges, and faces, or polygons. NURBS, on the other hand, use curves with bezier handles and splines, and the result is perfectly mathematically defined surfaces, whereas polygon-based modeling gives you a bunch of faces that are meshed together into a mesh. Think of it like raster versus vector graphics. Polygons are rasters and NURBS are vectors. <laughs> I personally like to work with polygons because they give you more fine control over what you want, but you can use either method. You usually start off with a primitive shape you can add with just a single click and then modify it to your desired goal. But you can also start from a curve and then convert it into a shape. You can start from a single vertex or you can draw the shape entirely. The software usually provides you with the basic tools you need, such as extruding, inserting and beveling the geometry. It also gives you some fancier tools like cutting points or rotating faces of the geometry, but you also have finer control over individual faces, edges, and even vertices of your meshes, and there's also a soft select option with customizable falloff as well as sculpting tools for finer control. Your goal is to make the shape you want. This is the part where I meant it's not software specific, so I can't tell you how to do that, but I can tell you what to be careful about when you do it. First and most importantly, bevel the edges. In real life, there's no such thing as a sharp edge. Even the sharpest of knives have the tiniest bit of bevel on the edge. Bevels help you catch the highlights and define the silhouette of the object. Don't worry about the polygon count, it's not that big of a deal as it was 50 years ago. On a middle class computer, you should be able to render at least 200,000 faces, and it's not that easy to get to that point either. Polygon count does not increase the render time by as much as you think it is, so don't worry about it too much, bevel the edges. Second of all, topology. Topology stands for the construction of your object. Most of the time, it's preferred to work in a model which only consists of quads. Quads are four-sided polygons. In my opinion, triangles work just as fine because quads 
mostly get triangulated in the rendering steps anyway. However, it is way simpler to model with quads. It's easier to insert edge loops and bridging faces and so on. Just use quads, that's way better. You also need to be careful not to have unsupported geometry or edges going into nothing because that could result in weird shading artifacts. Everything needs to be supported and consistent of quads. But by all means, avoid angons. Angons are a type of polygon that has more than four faces. You know, N stands for the number of the faces, so it's... Next up, normal orientation. The faces on your mesh have a direction where they're facing. The front side will be shaded as expected, but the back side can really get broken. So make sure your face orientation is set properly. Model parts. If your model is organic and will deform, such as my arm right now, make it all out of one part. We'll get to deformations later. But if your model has multiple parts, such as a drawer, make sure to make it out of separate parts. One part for the frame and one part for the drawer individually. Let them move independently, but make the model out of one part where this is needed. And finally, start simple and add details later. First, just block out your model and add the rough guidelines and then come back and add all the details you, you missed. It's like a 3D printer, you know, just finishing first layer before going back and finishing the other layer. And it's like just adding layers and layers. That's how it goes most of the time. Trust me, I speak from experience when I say it's gonna save you a lot of time to just go step by step. Don't try to make everything detailed and work your way up making the details because you're gonna you're gonna screw yourself over by doing that. Don't don't do it. Now avoid over detailing things as well, since that's a lot of excess geometry which isn't even doing anything. I know I said you don't have to worry about the poly count, but you still need to optimize the performance. This is making the render time longer for literally no reason at all. It's not adding any detail. Is just there. You can always add bump details in the texturing process, so don't worry about it yet. If you really want to add all this stuff, you can add, you can make two versions of the model, one which is a little bit more basic and the other which has all the high quality details, and you can use the high quality model to bake the information as a texture onto the simpler model. You'll get pretty much identical results. I know what you're saying. What the heck is a UV? Imagine like trying to unfold your entire model onto a flat surface and then projecting a texture onto the surface and reassembling it back. As you see, the faces that were previously touching have a disconnected texture because of the way of how the model unfolds. But softwares like Substance Painter are made to ignore the seams, as you would call them, and it just deforms the texture itself so it appears normal on the model. And no, you don't actually have to unfold your model like I've shown you that's done in the software automatically. Don't worry. You get a little window where you can move individual faces, which determines which parts of the texture will display on the actual model. However, some faces are separate and some are connected, which could deform the texture if you're not careful. And it's up to you to decide where the textures will disconnect. You need to place enough cuts or seams on your model to be able to unfold it fully onto a flat surface. If you don't do this, the texture will be projected at an angle, which will deform it. You usually place seams where an object is made out of multiple parts, since that part's not connected and you don't want the texture to just continue. But if you need to place cuts on parts that are made from a single object, try placing cuts in places which are less likely to be seen by the camera. If this is your character's face, try placing most of the cuts on the back of your head, behind the ears, on the eyebrows, and so on. I usually use Substance Painter so I can get away with having a, an automatically generated UV map and create a custom texture so I don't have to worry about the seams. It does give me more work, but it also gives me way more power with the textures that I want. You can also separate UV parts entirely. Those are called UV islands, and sometimes those said islands are necessary in parts of your mesh that have a pretty sharp angle because because when making the normal map, you need some margin around the faces so they don't bleed onto each other, otherwise you just get weird artifacts. You'll see what I mean in a second. I actually like this part because it's straightforward and not too complicated, but just challenging enough. In the 3D world, a texture does not consist of a single image. It actually uses several different ones. There's textures that define the object's emission, opacity, and refraction and stuff like that, but today we're gonna focus on the main five maps you're mostly going to use. The different textures are called maps, by the way. A base color map, a roughness map, a metallic map, a height map, and a normal map. How do they work? Why do you need five? Let's take a look. The base color is the most straightforward one. I've also used it in the UV unwrapping example with the cube. It's pretty much color. What color is your object? That's what most people usually mean when they say texture. It gives you flat information about the object's color, which is assigned by the face positioning on the UV map. We add the other four maps to make it more realistic and you'll see why. A roughness map is usually a black and white image which determines how reflective your material is gonna be, where black parts of a texture are completely reflective and white parts are completely diffused. That's how you can make parts of your item look reflective and glossy and the other parts are completely diffused. Just keep in mind that nothing is 100% reflective that doesn't exist in real life. If you're 
entire model is reflective, you don't need a special texture for it. You can just set the value for it and it'll be applied to the entire mesh. We use maps to affect different parts of the object differently. Just be wary that all maps are connected to each other and to some degree they will look similar. Next up is the metallic map, which is also black and white, where the white parts are made to look like metal and the black parts remain normal. It's hard to explain exactly what it does, but it pretty much makes the object darker and amplifies the highlights. It makes it look like metal and adds contrast to the material. The metallic map usually consists of completely white and completely black parts. There's not many grays because there's not really a half metallic material. Then we have the height map, which is also a black and white map. This map will physically displace your model. The middle color, which is 50% gray, will keep the surface where it is. White parts will raise the surface and black parts will dent it inwards. Here's another reason to make sure your normals are oriented properly. Using this map, you can shape the surface of your material to make it look like wood or rocks or anything you want. It's a great way to add detail to your project, but it's usually very pricey, hard to compute and takes a lot of time and power. And that's why we have the normal maps. That's not the real reason, the purpose is to create tiny details on the model. The thing about normal maps is that they're easier to compute, but they don't physically displace your materials, it just makes it look like they do. If you look at a normal map from the side, you will see that the face is still flat. So the normal maps are used to make smaller detail where it's more difficult to notice that it's not actually being displaced. Maybe like scratches, tiny bolts and stuff like that, little bumps on the surface. It's mostly blue, but it uses magenta, cyan, yellow and green to signify displacement from all sides of the texture. The contrast determines how tall the fig displacement is. Once again, it doesn't actually displace your geometry, it just makes it look like it's displaced. Combine all these maps together, as well as a selection of other available maps, you can create photorealistic objects. I just want to mention that no surface is perfect. Always make sure to add little dust specks, fingerprints or scratches where it makes sense, or gunk on the walls, or any signs of imperfection. Think of how this thing was used and show signs of usage on the texture to make it more realistic. Just don't go overboard because it's really easy to go overboard. Now your object needs controls, which can be manipulated to make your object move like you want it to and make an animation. You can already move, rotate and scale entire meshes, so objects that are made from a single piece don't really need fancy controls, but it's still more organized if you do that. Plus it helps you differentiate which objects are going to be moved and which are just decorative pieces. If you have an object made from multiple pieces, you can put them in a box and parent all of the parts onto it, so when you move the box, it all moves with it. You can also add controller curves and parent them to your main box, so when you move the curve, it will also move the individual pieces. That's how you organize the animation. You generally don't want to animate meshes, but only the controls which the meshes are parented on. You want to leave the geometry clean. You can also limit the information of the controller, so there's no way you can break it. There's also constraints that let you rotate one thing by rotating the other. You can make an object always pointing towards another object. You can use one's position to control another's rotation, and so on. You can set up any kind of controls to use once you actually start animating. For my short CGI film, I've set up two controllers that rotate all of the wheels as well as the caterpillar tracks in relation to each other simply by dragging one slider. I also know that the head is going to be moved and rotated independently from the rest of the character, so I've also made a control for that. Get creative and make it functional. Now as far as the deformation goes, not only do you have several deforming operations at hand, but most of the time people use bones for fine perfection. You can place so-called bones into your mesh, which are connected via hierarchy that move together. From then, you can bind the mesh onto your bones and paint the area of effect for individual bones for individual vertices. When this joint of the skeleton moves, it will affect all of these vertices by this much. And once you set up the entire system, the object will deform its geometry based on the position of the skeleton. And that is how people make stuff move. From there you can also help yourself by using IK handles and pull vectors and stuff like that that will help you with the animation of the rig. Animation consists of a series of keyframes on the timeline. You can set the position of the cube in the center of the world at frame 1, but set it 10 meters towards the left on frame 12. And when you play back the timeline, the cube will move left by 10 meters in 12 frames. You also have the power to control the transition graph of the motion, where the horizontal axis is the past time and the vertical axis is the amount of motion. You can move around the bezier handles to change the interpolation of the movement in between of the currently set keyframes. The endpoints remain untouched, but the transition in between them is interpolated on the graph. Just like you can move the cube, you can also rotate the joints, change values, animate textures, and pretty much animate anything which is possible to keyframe in the software. There's also a series of functions you can apply, like noise, wave functions, copy pasting and moving keyframes, cycling the animation, and so on. You have all the tools you need. Plus you have the power to adjust all of those values individually on X, Y, and Z axes. So you can literally customize the motion as much as you want. Now it takes a lot of practice to get all these tools to create something which looks realistic. There's plenty of things to keep in mind 
elements such as gravity, mass, overlapping action, balance, and so on. There's a lot of physics involved, and it's a science all by itself. I definitely plan on making more tutorials about this in the future, because animation is my main focus in the industry, so hit the bell to keep an eye out for it. There are virtual lights inside of 3D softwares, which can be assigned different attributes like color, strength, shape, and so on. Those lights can interact with your objects and make them visible to the camera. There are many types of lights. Point lights, spotlights, the sunlight, which is always parallel, area lights, mesh lights, and so on. One of the popular methods is using an HDRI 360 panorama, which contains light information from all around the taken location. It also provides reflections all around, because it's 360. It's a lazy but effective solution, to which you can also add your lights for smaller tweaks and personal corrections. Overall, lighting is a huge, huge topic, so there's no way I can possibly mention all of it here, but overall what you want to do with lighting is make sense in the environment that it's in, show all the details you want seen on your character, and hide all the things you want hidden. Shadows are equally important as the lights. I've recently made a video about lighting. It's made for the purposes of Mindimeter, but it uses actual tips from the filmmaking light theory. You can go watch it if you want, or search up a lighting tutorial on YouTube, there's plenty of them nowadays, but it will definitely make a blender-oriented lighting tutorial in the future. 3D animation also offers the glory of simulation. You set up a bunch of things like bounding boxes, gravity, mass, and physical attributes of the simulated stuff, press play, and it will all behave naturally like it would in real life. If you had cloth simulations to add life to your animations, or make the character's clothes react to the environment for you, there are smoke simulations and fluid simulations, you've got particle simulations for some pretty nice effects, soft body, rigid body, hair, dynamic paint, you name it. There's also different force fields you can apply, like vortex, wind, turbulence, magnetic, and most of these don't even know what they do. But there's plenty of everything and you can use all that to simulate anything you want. And whether or not you actually need a simulation in your animation is generally just really fun to play with. If you don't want to become a 3D artist, I recommend you download Blender just for the heck of playing with the simulations for a while. It's really, really fun. <laughs> After a simulation looks perfect, you just have to bake it. Not only will it make it run quicker, because the simulation is now baked, but it will also stop the randomness. You will always get the same result because it's no longer trying to simulate it. It's simulated once and it's using the same playback of the simulation over and over again. That way it stays consistent and it doesn't lag. Finally, it's time to render your masterpiece. The actual rendering process describes output settings, such as resolution, output location, number of samples, the file format, and so on, but I'll include the camera side of things as well, because I don't know where to put it in the process. Everything is better with added depth of field. That being said, you can set depth of field of the camera in the software, adjusting the number of aperture blades and the f-stop just like you would operating an actual camera. You can also change the focal length as well as the sensor size and customize the camera attributes to your likings. Again, like holding an actual camera. That's a tip for more of your technical people, but go nuts. The sample size determines how many light samples the software will take when calculating the end result. The higher the number, the more accurate and less noisy the image will be, but it will also take longer to render. You need to find a delicate balance of how long you're willing to wait and how good of a result you actually want. Keep in mind that 50 frames is only 2 seconds of animation, and if it takes you 1 minute per frame, that's 50 minutes of rendering time for only 2 seconds. You can't do that. If you want a better result in less time, there's also an option of denoising, which is pretty great, but with a lower sample size, it sometimes makes the end result a bit jittery. You can also export at a lower resolution or use less light bounces. Light bounces determine how many times the light will bounce between different objects. Usually more than 4 bounces are barely noticeable, so don't be afraid to lower that setting down as well. With all that said, set your resolution, your frame rate, your output location and your file format. It's recommended that you export as a PNG sequence and then stitch them together in an editing software, because if the software were to crash while you're rendering, you don't lose all the progress like you would exporting a video file. And once all that's done, you can render the animation, bring yourself some snacks, lay back and watch some YouTube videos. I recommend a channel called Sharpen, he's got some pretty nice content, you should all subscribe to him. You obviously need to add some sound effects, music, maybe color grades, small tweaks like that, but as far as 3D space goes, your animation is done. You are now equipped with all the knowledge you need to make your own 3D animation, except for actually using the software. <laughs> You have to learn that part on your own, because this video is not software specific. Or you can just wait for me to actually start making Blender tutorials, whatever you want. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned about 3D animation, and if you did, smash the hell out of the like button and ring the bell to get notified of my videos as they come out. I'm starting to make Blender tutorials soon, so there's plenty of content to come, and be on the lookout for my short CGI film. I think I should be done within a month. All that being said, thanks for watching, and stay sharp.